Happy Thanksgiving to those of you in the United States and to everybody. I want to let you know that I purchased Disney Plus because as fellow nerd Herr von Sennen told me, it's only two beers a month. And who could argue with that? Hello out there, I'm the Oldest Nerd, and today we're going to be talking about Episode 2 and Episode 3 of The Mandalorian. Now, uh, when I first saw this, I was impressed with it because it does emulate uh, classic westerns and was done pretty well, but I wasn't certain. I was still kind of on the fence as to whether to join Disney Plus or not. And I went ahead and looked at Episode 2 and Episode 3 and was much more impressed. Other people have told me that uh, by the time you get to episode three, you find out what this series is really about. And so episode one obviously was just an introduction of the Mandalorian character himself. But in episode two, uh, he's already found the um, the child, as they called it in episode two, the, uh, the baby from Dagobah, who uh, actually is kind of an infant, uh, or rather a, um, a toddler, uh, more than an infant, because uh, he can stand, he can walk a little bit, and he can manipulate things. Uh, without giving too much away, he is uh, uh, able to uh, uh, capture uh, just a little bit of humanity out of the Mandalorian in uh, trying to play with the knob on one of the levers in the Mandalorian ship. At any rate, uh, when they get back to the ship, the ship has been stripped by Jawas, and they're just about to get away as the Mandalorian uh, tries to uh, take on a fight with them. Now, of course, he can't win the fight. He's outnumbered uh, by the Jawas, and uh, his, uh, his friend who uh, was along with him, uh, who thought that he was dead, uh, is, uh, returns to him and tells him how he can negotiate with the Jawas. And the Jawas want uh, him to uh, get something, want an egg of an exotic animal, which looks kind of like a bear that's a rhinoceros also. And uh, you have to give them credit for how they're designing their creatures. They're doing a pretty good job with that. So he has to, of course, fight with this rhino bear. And uh, for the first time, we find out that the child has the force. Now, uh, it does not seem to be all of that um, familiar to the Mandalorian. He doesn't right know what's going on, but finds something is special about the child and is, of course, very happy that his life has been saved as a result of this child. Anyway, they're able to uh, um, uh, make a deal with uh, the Jawas, and uh, that is episode two. Now, now uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, this appears to be, since we have Jawas and we have kind of a desert planet, it looks very much like Tatooine. Now, we have not established whether the Jawas are native to Tatooine or if you find them in other places, but uh, I don't believe that they named the planet that he was going to, so uh, it's interesting that uh, they always like to start things and usually end them on Tatooine. So in episode three, entitled The Sin, uh, we have the Mandalorian uh, uh, bringing the child back to the people who he is employed by. And we've heard in earlier episodes, of course, that uh, we don't know what they wanted him for, whether they were going to eat him or adopt him. And uh, they take him away and, and remind him of the code that you don't ever ask what the bounty is for, or what this person is going to end up being. And so uh, he goes away, he takes his reward, which is interesting in that uh, it looks like uh, bars made out of some kind of metal, and they are, uh, but instead of them being a unit of money, what they are, are things that can be melted down and make new armor. And we see for the first time the Mandalorian culture, which has been moved underground after the Empire. They had sided kind of with the Empire during the wars, and now that the Empire is a thing of the past, the um, uh, they are forced underground, and uh, uh, while uh, they are known to be around, uh, you only see them about one at a time, and uh, they keep their helmets on as a matter of maintaining a um, partial uh, uh, security and uh, partial just cultural identity. 
So uh, we have a, a lot of interest in how the Mandalorians uh, uh, consider uh, honor and duty and uh, the charitable nature that I mentioned in our first video about the Mandalorian is that uh, that's something that uh, they are, um, it's part of their culture. This is the way is a repeated term that they use when they're together. Our secrecy is our survival. So we see the um, um, uh, people that he was dealing with, uh, which were um, ex-Empire types we know, and uh, even uh, there were some stormtroopers in uncharacteristically dirty armor. Um, something I found out that's kind of interesting about this, and it's been pointed out by others in the films, is that uh, Empire armor isn't really that good. You can shoot a stormtrooper once and always knock him down, whereas uh, the Mandalorian has uh, and, and his like uh, can take quite a few hits on their armor without having any physical damage to them. And uh, so I'm thinking that uh, maybe the Empire could have learned something from them during the time that they were cooperating. No. Yes, I know. No. We have visitors and Kitty doesn't like it. Anyway, for uh, turning over the child, uh, the Mandalorian just wants another job. And this next job is going to send him to the ocean dunes of Karak. But a uh, flash of conscience makes him want to go back and save the child. And uh, that creates uh, a lot of conflict between him and his own people, and of course him and uh, the people who are uh, uh, giving him his employment. And so uh, this is a struggle that uh, we see, and probably the reason that they call this episode The Sin. So uh, we'll see this as a, a way that our main character is going to be much more... I won't say independent, but but certainly more isolated. So uh, that's what we see so far, and and I have a couple of things that uh, really interest me about uh, about this show. One of which is that they do not go too cute. Something that's bothered me ever since Return of the Jedi is that they have to have a heavy cute factor. Let's have uh, a whole bunch of little people that look kind of like George Lucas, and in here. We have, of course, the the child who has uh, it, it. I won't say that he isn't cute, but at the same time, uh, he seems to be kind of a cipher for the Mandalorian to figure out. And the stories are very tight. They center around the main character and don't go too far out to make you know too many characters or too many intersecting plot points. Uh, this is um, uh, kind of a, a breath of fresh air in the way that they write science fiction these days in that they have to have a very complex story, so you'll want to watch it over and over. And I think maybe they've gotten the formula here that you're going to want to watch this over and over just because it's compelling to watch. It's well written, it's tightly directed, and... 30 minutes uh, usually isn't enough time to tell a story, but in this, they do so. And they do so with a lot of visual elements and not a whole lot of dialogue, not a whole lot of explanation. And it leads to more interest on my part. So uh, I'd like to know what you think about all of this and certainly let me know in the comments and uh, also um, how you're getting along with your family if you're spending them with Thanksgiving. Uh, we have, uh, we've had a combination of things that have happened uh, here that uh, have caused our family to get together a little sooner than usual. And uh, we also have a few extra pets. Let me know how your holiday has gone, if you had a holiday. If not, uh, uh, let me know what you think about the program as well. And like the dog said, don't go far.